Namaste. Hi. As teachers, growing as a practice is essential, so we can give meaningful, safe, and progressive lessons to our students. And it's easier said than done. Yoga, teaching yoga, is not the most financially rewarding, yeah, but it's spiritually meaningful. Yeah. And I know, yeah, and especially in this modern life, yeah, we need to catch up. Yeah. Someone has to pay the bill, so to speak. Yeah. So how can we yeah, keep growing as a practice amidst yeah, the challenges of this pathway yeah, we choose to tackle? Yeah. For example, yeah, I just finished my online class, so my body is already warm. So I'll do my self practice. So I cut my my requirement, my time requirement into the yeah, half. So I save that time I normally would a lot warming up the body, yeah, into some deeper progressions already. Yes, and I would give maybe thirty minutes, one hour if I'm tackling deeper elements for my self practice, and I do it every day. All right. So if you need to wake up early in the morning so you can do your self practice, do that. All right. That's the way for us to really feel the essence. Yeah, not just the asana. Yeah, if you are a meditation teacher, you have to do your meditation too. Theory is far different from the actual experience. If you're an asana teacher, practice your asana. Yeah, it doesn't matter what style of yoga you teach, you need to grow it. Right, so I am doing my self practice actually now, so you may want to gain an insight or two, or maybe join me. All right. So on the back, yeah, reclining position. <laughs> And then a few more of this side to side. Uh, and then as yoga teachers, especially if you're teaching online, because we are more dependent on role modeling. Yeah? So we're flowing you know, with our students. And then generally you have to do yeah, lots of like demonstration. And you might find one side of you is... Yeah, more active and then doing that function. Well, so self practice. Yeah. So you can bring the body back into its balanced state. All right, and I do this. Yeah. I particularly love this transition because this is like a compounded way of opening the body, yeah, loosening the joints. And moving up and down to a gentle rocking motion. Although this practice of mine uh, is predominantly asana based, so I a lot, yeah, an hour of my day doing pranayama. I do 30 minutes in the morning after waking up, I make sure I have ample time to prepare for that one. So I would wake up maybe an hour earlier than my normal requirements so I can practice my pranayama. And I'm an early riser too, so that suits me. And I will teach, well, and if I yeah, um, have time to do my self-practice after the class, yeah, such as today, I do that. And it becomes a part of me already. Yeah. And I teach every day. <laughs> Although not full on, yeah, but I teach every day. And then when you teach every day, even if you have like one or two classes that day, your mind gets uh, caught up with the lessons, the preparation. It's still like a full day of work. Okay. And from there, I'm just turning over, flipping over, so I can practice my Masakridasana on this one. And I circle around that hip, and I'm finding that leg to side to side. And then releasing the shoulder. And then changing the other one. And then, depending on the stage of your practice, yeah, you might just do distinctive elements. 
Yeah, but what's important is you move your spine in various direction. And what are this? Like twisting, extension, side bending, forward bending, and back bends. And inversions. Yeah, mudras. When it comes to you know, Hatha Yoga, it's the Viparita Karani. And those are the elements I will be practicing. All right. And then a mild chest stretch. Good. And easy down the low spine. All right, downward dog, lifting to alternate, legs, yeah, turning and angling. And also, my self-practice is not as direct when it comes to alignment. I'm focusing more on the internal sensations. My inner body is maybe just too open for the rigidity of the physical alignment. I focus on them less but it doesn't mean yeah, that, that you can't just do it without preparing you yeah strength yeah and of course yeah your breath yeah so it's like the advanced stages of the practice already so once you develop the physical alignment in the first few years of your practice you know your inner body will just open and you will just your own way of doing your similar techniques <laughs> but the focus and the theme and the essence is far deeper than what your eyes see all right and right away i'll do my ustrasana the camel pulse i focus more on the back bends, and the deep hip openers, and maybe a few arm balances to finish. Or sometimes I would do my arm balancing at the beginning of the session. Now back bends are essential. Or you can walk your knees in the middle there, and then moving to a bit of a sway. Let me angle so you can appreciate the motion. Okay, and swinging up and down, yeah, side to side, and circle around. Okay, because if you are too linear in your practice, you don't give time for the inner linings, you go give chance for those inner pockets to open, and then by doing coiling motion, yeah, yeah, swaying forward and backwards, yeah, somehow you free your body of uh, the stickiness of the physical. I know, well, you might be coming from a very strict alignment tradition, yeah. but be open. Yeah. Our bodies, our energies are not perfectly linear. It's not perfectly symmetrical. It's coiling like that inside the body and by doing and then going through the flow of that energy. <coughs> You create more openness and lightness. Right? And then hang. And then try to you know, rub your spine around those you know, linings and spaces. You, know, you can like lean over one side. And then see? My spine is opening already. <laughs> Although yeah, it doesn't mean that a beginner will be able to accomplish this right away. This just requires yeah, deep internal awareness of the energy locks. Yeah. And then swing in, of course, the breath. Okay. Breathing in, forward and back. Yeah. Yeah. Inhaling. Yeah. I'm chasing for that lightness. Okay. My first try. Okay, beautiful. Open up. I will do this first yeah, before the deeper ones so I can realign. Yeah, walking those knees to the middle. Then they go under the hips. You know, one side might be tighter than the other, especially when you're doing the first few rounds.
Krishna, right? Yeah. And I just try to open the spine. All right, breathing in. Yeah, lift back up and exhale. All right. And then you can adjust yeah, by waving, circling around. Okay. And then maybe I flow. Sometimes I would just do a downward dog. And then kicking those joints out of the way after the kneeling. And then this transition of mine feels so good inside. You can also adjust that corresponding hand and then <laughs> draw away from the hips. Hmm. I might do a flow if you like doing that. And to the back. Okay. One asymmetrical. <laughs> Body is just still light. <laughs> I'm also involving my throat and my tongue and my mouth more because through that I can gain deeper access to the hip flexors, the ida and the pingala. Yes, like I'm, I'm coiling in and out of my hip joints, my femur joints, and I'll do this as well. This yeah, moment when you're up in mid-air, yeah, like you're an elastic, stretching. Then you're lighter. And then sometimes if I feel like Oh, I still need a few more drills to prepare. I will just do the variation. But this time, I feel like I can do this already. Readjust, wave it, coiling in and out, breathing. I find a kapada kaputasana actually easier to do than the kaputasana. Probably because you have that leverage for adjustment, whereas in kaputasana, you need to really keep your hips upright. But this one requires more strength, actually, and control. All right, come up. Yeah. Push away and recover. All right, all the way up. Wow, nice and deep. I flex it down, and then side to side. Yeah, let me just. Switch off my heating. Nice and chilly this morning, but now it's getting warm and moist. Into the back. All right, lifting. Yeah, releasing the keg. Stretching the side trunk. Back bending for me is really one of the most challenging ones. <laughs> it's never easy. Yeah, took me many years. You know, I'm sharing with you my actual practice. I'm not 
as open as maybe a lot of practitioners there. But I can say I have not hurt myself, not a single chance doing this. I'm just so grateful I have the physical strength to begin with, to work on my foundation. Yes, you might rub your skin there, and maybe suffer from a burning skin, scratch, yeah, but no internal yeah, pain at all. Nothing that prevents me from practicing the following day. Breathe. And it doesn't have to be deep all the time. But tackle the same principle of opening the spine in many directions. But, so, you may ask, how frequent should you do your asana? I say every day. <laughs> Three times per week minimum. Yeah, but if you have the chance, try your best every day. Asana. And then, asana is, the, is separate from pranayam. Pranayam, daily. Between what? 30 minutes to an hour. Yes, it's demanding. But we've chosen this path. So we can, as I've mentioned earlier, learn from our practice, learn from our mistakes, so we prevent them from happening to our students. Yeah. And even the breath changes when the inner body is open. So in Ekapada, since even if you're doing and bending over one side, you need to open you know, the front side too. Actually, it's the front side in Ekapada Kapotasana, which initiates the back bend, not the back side. And the back side is already open, so you need to use the foundation of the front leg to open you up further to the back. Yes, so your knees remain grounded. You're pushing through them. And here you can just adjust by wiggling. And it, this part of me is my looser side. So I approach my back bend this side differently. So no masking, raw practice. <laughs> the true and the real experience. You might fall. You might not be the most open and graceful of all, but internally you feel profound and deep sensations inside. Ooh, sweet. Waving. And even if you do those deep ones, you can still feel like 
yeah, blockages get lingering there. And then by rubbing your joints around, yeah, you can release tight spots. Okay, feel like flowing. Okay. Kapitasana. For some teaching again. In an hour. So that, that doesn't prevent me from practicing. Yeah, it's habit. You know, once you develop the pattern of doing your routine, it's easy to sustain. Yeah. It's actually more difficult not to do it <laughs> because your body will ache. <laughs> or maybe this is just my nature coming from a very disciplined, not disciplined force, but because I love doing it. I started fitness at the young age of 13. I started with weight training, and I was so motivated back then, well, until now I do it, that it becomes part of my life. And most of my teaching career, or my professional, my income earning work, is teaching. Yeah. And a bulk of it is teaching fitness, yeah. not just yoga. I am a personal trainer. I teach cardio classes too. Well, not as often as before, but I'm so grateful to have the foundation because through them yeah, my body build, building years, my power lifting years I think they all happen because of a reason and that gives me the solid foundation of physical Strength. Yeah, so if you can ask me, what a really good foundational practice leading to deeper yoga, hatha yoga, or you may call it asana practice. Yeah, weight training, some bodybuilding, power training. Yeah, that's really to help you develop the organic way of breathing through you know, the internal body, gaining and then utilizing internal power yeah, to sustain at least you know, the initial stages of your asana practice. But I feel like doing another one. I can still feel yeah, around my thoracic needs to open. And this is where I'm going to be using my tongue. Yes, in here I'm tracing the discs of my spine. So if you notice, I approach it differently. I'm like tucking. So my hips remain slightly yeah, backwards, so I can curl from here. Yeah, it's like a flipping, like a hook. And then even the arms change. It's not that straight, but more fluid, more hanging, and loose. 
because I'm back bending from the thoracic already. Push down, hooking, and opening backwards. And this is deeper through the upper regions of the spine. And like a hips remain upright. Oh, yes. We can feel the Manipura chakra opens up in the chest, deep on the thighs. Because you're using actually here the knees, pushing down. Yeah, you're gonna feel this really engaged. Yeah, to support, yeah. Yeah, back bending. And in the throat and the tongue. Yeah. Assist in drawing that one up. All right. Good. Yeah, you feel heavy. Yeah, that's part of it. Yeah, because back bending is like weight training for the back. Like you've done many rounds and repetitions of bicep curl, <laughs> squats, and you're gonna feel the pressure. But as soon as you move and recover, feels like you wanna do it again. <laughs> if you're coming from a weight training background, like after recovering, feels like you wanna do it again. Because you know you still can. But for me, I feel that's enough. Even I wanted to do it again so I can finish the rest of the elements. Okay, don't do this, eh? I so said this is quite deep in advance already. My variation of Mula Bandasana. And then even the way you access your asanas change too. As the inner body opens, yeah, our ways and our technique change too, but the end goal is the same. The breath changed too. In here, if you notice, my breathing pattern has changed too since the hips, yeah. The Plavini Pranayama, or the floating breath, helps us draw the energy from the Swadishtana Chakra. And again, that's another beautiful benefit when we do our self-practice, practical learning, because through that we will understand the essence of the text. Yes. For example, Plavini Pranayama. It doesn't mean you're swallowing the breath. It means bringing your attention there and then breathing through it. Yes, it can draw and lift the heaviness of yeah, sacral lumbar spine, uh, which yeah, houses the Swadishtana chakra. Yeah, Pavini means to float, yeah, and then Swadishtana chakra is related to the element of water, our reproductive and creative functions. And then side to side, <coughs> circle around. Mm, it feels good. All right, and up and over, and backwards. All right, alternate. Yep. One more. I do the elements at least twice, because the first one is always the, yeah, I mean the trial. Yeah. And then the second one is where you can gain access to the deeper spaces inside the body. Beautiful.
right? Bharadvadasana. Mulabandasana, this is like my variation. Gorakshasana. And internally, this gives us access to the Kandanadi, yeah? the lingam of the hips. Because this is like the vessel yeah, inside. And then this one traces those inner linings. And then the Pavini Pranayama allows us to gain access to those linings of uh, energetic anatomy. Good. So these are now Guyasanas. Guyasanas are seemingly, um, they resemble asana, but the origin is far, I say, deeper and then more encompassing and more internal. Uh, where common alignment, physical alignment principles may not apply anymore because you are following and then riding yeah, the manifestation and the wave of your energy. But of course, you will still use the body in supporting your joints and supporting your vital organs. So it's not just mere flexibility. It's like understanding the body, yeah, how it moves internally. I am not a theoretical person. I know the theory, but just the basics. But I can describe how the body and the breath and then all within <laughs> relate with one another. And practical learning is far more important than theoretical learning. Well, that's me. Yeah. All right. Good. I'll do maybe a round or two of the reclining. Badapadmasana. Let me just get this one out of the way. And even here, yeah. Soothing our physical nature and balances in my encounter, like one side is more open than the other. Yeah, what's the purpose of getting the most symmetrical of all, <laughs> but internally you feel lopsided and then heavy? Yeah. No benefit in doing that, forcing yourself for the glory of it. Because the book says you have to square this and that and that. Yes, in turn, or uh, uh, initially you can do that. But as I've mentioned, the energy body is the opposite. It likes to move and coil in various directions. All right, free your legs and the arms. No. So it's restless, so to speak. Yeah. And then the restlessness actually is good. Why? Because through that, we can differentiate stillness. Yeah. So we need to experience both the active side of our energy anatomy, which is the pana, the kundalini, the shakti. So when we do our stillness, which include maybe a pranayam and meditative observances, mudras, and 
you can now do the opposite. Okay, I'll do the other side. What's the time? Oh. Open. I still have like 20 minutes to spare. All right. Now pulling and drawing that part of you, getting in the way. And then the tongue can assist us in gaining access behind the collarbone and also behind the haps. And then just breathe through the discomfort. Yes, discomfort is part of it, but should not cause pain. Pain is bad, discomfort is good. Okay, so we can sustain the rigors of stillness. Yeah? How can we sustain stillness if we do not know how to endure <laughs> restlessness and discomfort or even slight pain? Mm. All right, the book says sit in Padmasana and doing your stillness, but Padmasana, it's not just Padmasana. There's progression leading to it. And that's what's not written in the books. And I'm sharing with you ways to do that. Okay, do I feel like flowing? Yes, yeah. let me try. Because the next one is mostly flexion and deep hip openness already. Okay. Back here. <laughs> Bada Padmasana. Yeah, moving that side, gaining access to that nadi. This is my right side, so gaining access to my, or massaging my pingala and opening my ida. Okay, return to the middle. Maybe uh, just a gentle one on this side. All right. And find the middle. And an asana is not static. Yeah, always find that opportunity to trace the linings, feeling the edges. You might not be perfect structurally, externally. You might not be picture perfect, but feels good inside. And it's a right to commit mistakes. Yeah. In this modern world, especially yeah, social media, and then beautiful things we see in the pictures. And then when we try to, oh, I can't even do that. Well, yeah, you never know. Yeah. And then what's behind <laughs> that beautiful picture is actually not always beautiful. <laughs> so just be. 
It's your practice. There's no competition of who <laughs> does it the best. We're not the center of the world, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> But we can be always happy and content of our progress. And when we are in that state of happiness, yeah, that's my inspiration for the word sukha content, mm -hmm. then whatever thoughts, you know, words, teachings, insights coming from us always come from that happy place. So you, you can't talk through them eh, without consulting books yeah, because you are relating, yeah, expressing your experience. All right. I'm flowing up and down. Yeah. Entering now uh, the final stage of my practice. Uh, just do more techniques. Sometimes I do alternate. Yeah. All right. I prepare now the Kandasana. Easy for Supta. Kandasana, this one, it's like Mula Bandasana, but it's more focused on really drawing the energy out of those nadis and then direct the, nadi, the energy into the midline, yeah, the shumna, and then from there I flip over. for a variation of the Viparita Karan. Massaging the ankle, rubbing the tongue, rolling the eyes. Over I go, wave the hips, move your spine away from the pockets of the shoulders, one arm, halasana. <laughs> I, can't, I even cross the leg because I feel the spine, we need to gain access of the opposite side. It's one of the functions of mudra. So after opening the internal pockets of the lower regions, the hips, the abdomen, the chest, yeah, you make way for the opening of the upper pathways, the back of the neck, yeah, the vishuddhi, yeah, that's the back of the neck, yeah, connected to the front. And of course, the upper chakras, the ajna between the eyebrows, inside the brain, the middle brain, and the cranial apex. Yeah. 
Actually, the Shahashara chakra. Yeah, although we can stimulate the, the nerves, but it's actually the Ajna inside, um, which uh, that is, I say, more important uh, to purify. Yeah. Ajna inside is related to the eyebrow center, but it's not. Yeah, externally there are nerves there when the energy um, can yeah rise to the internal the cranium. Yeah, you can feel the nerves there, but intern it's inside. Yeah, it's sitting yeah in the midbrain. Yeah. I had this lesson about the the sarga uh, chakra inside. Yeah, the ventricular nervous system. Yeah, the Ajna chakra is sitting just below them, yeah, where the pineal gland and the pituitary gland meet at the intersection. So it's like the intersection of the pons, yeah, the middle of Longata, the pons at the top, yeah, and from there, yeah, at the back you have the, the pineal gland, the front you have the pituitary gland, and then they intersect in the middle because that's where the bindu, yeah, the somarasa, drips from the Visargra chakra, the ventricular system. And then mudra is about that, yeah, drawing the energy through the middle channel, and then from there it will release its force, yeah, in the ventricular nervous system. And then from there, yeah, the CSF flows through the fontanelles, and that's where yeah, the Sahasrara chakra is made open. But yeah, the Sahasrara chakra, well, all the inversions hit stand and assist us in stimulating the nerves there. Yeah. It will just inevitably open up once the Ajna chakra is made open. Yeah. So, if you can ask me, what's more important in creating or attaining the Samadhi? Is it the Sashwara or the, sh the Ajna? The Ajna. Because the Ajna is where we release the potent force. by deeper mudras, for example, um, the Shambhavi mudra, the internal or external, the Kachari mudra, the insertion of the tongue to the back of the nasal cavity, they all are techniques for stimulating yeah, the Ajna chakra and also the Talu and the um, then the Visarga chakra inside the, the um, ventricular nervous system. All right, this is the last. And then the Kandasana, this position, has a direct link yeah, to the Ajahn chakra. Why? Because in the Kandanadi, uh, the Kandanadi is like the oblong shape there, yes, the lingam. Yeah, that's where the three fundamental nadis start from, in the middle. Yeah, Sushumna Ida Pingala, yeah, and they branch out and still inside the pouch. Yeah, and the Kandanadi is very encompassing because it stimulates and influences three bottom chakras, the Muladhara, the Shuddhasana, and the first half of the Manipura chakra. Yeah. And then that one, when the halves are open, it can actually bypass yeah, the other chakras. It can go straight to the Ajna inside. Yeah. Because the primal force are in inherent hidden potential. It's dormant in the halves. And then once the halves are made open, yeah, I mean the internal halves, yeah, meaning the energetic the side of it, yeah, you can use yeah, your internal awareness, the breath, and the other mudras. Yeah, that's the reason mudras. Mudras are a way to channelize the energy. Yeah. So they're not asanas anymore. Yeah. They mimic like asana. For example, this one, for me, there's a mudra, the Viparita Karani mudra. When you're inverted, there's a ways for you to yeah, send the energy higher from the hips. Okay, this one. Yeah. Look. Good. 
Let me just stay silent for a moment. All right. finished it took me an hour probably or more inner thighs no. all of the transitional techniques I do I always share with you in this uh, on this channel my lessons especially the classes you always encounter the circular motions yeah. They're all inspired by my self-practice. Okay, a few of this. All right, Lavini, the side, directly there. All right, beautiful. All right, and finishing. and try to do an active transition. Make sure I have the space, I don't want to be breaking the wall. my and stand <laughs> it's too light beautiful and then down to the sitting Good. Accomplished. Yeah. Now I can focus my day yeah, to my teachings, to my responsibilities at home, yeah, outside myself, and have time, maybe an hour, to relax and watch my favorite show. <laughs> Inhale, arms left. And exhale down. Breathing in, yes. You know, we're part of the modern existence. Yeah. There's no yeah, taking this yeah, chance and freedom yeah, to enjoy yeah, a common pleasures, yeah? as long as we do everything in moderation. All right, namaste everyone, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Bye-bye.